going to God a workman that needed not to be ashamed, write the divine word of truth. And you don't, your faith, if, even though you may have faith for saving grace, that come by here and here by the word of God, but um, oh, you have little faith. He talked to some of the disciples. Some of his faith is so pathetic and pitiful. You're not even motivated nor inspired. You ought to be, but you're not, and that's your own problem, personal problem. They get out in the highways and byways and hedges and compel them to come in and seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things in addition. And some of you don't have any addition so far as your faith is concerned. You were saved by the grace of God, kept by the power of God and sealed the Holy Spirit of God in the day of redemption. But other than that, you've got no labors whatsoever that's going to stand against the judgment seat of Christ when you give an account for every deed done in the body, good or bad. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, you better be persuaded not picnic, but a terror. The terror of the Lord, he said, we persuade men. So God help you to get busy about the Father's business and shake off and straighten up and, and to get, you, uh, get your house in order and get things straightened out between you and your God because it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. He said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. What a man soweth the same shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall reap corruption. That's all that's in the flesh. And you need to be sure that you're going to reap corruption. And you're going to wind up suffering a great loss and being ashamed before a man is coming when you face him at the judgment seat of Christ. So if I were you, and I was I was saved, and I am what I mean is you as a Christian, you need to really walk where the vocation where you've been called and lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets you. You might run a pace of race that's set before you. There's a race that's set before you, whether you run a good race or not, or fight a good fight or not, it'll be up to you as an individual. But if you don't, you're going to wind up being... Shame before him is coming. You're going to wind up suffering a great loss. You're going to wind up causing somebody to go to hell, whether you meant to or you intended to or not. God has committed souls to your trust, and it'll be up to you to search out and seek out who they are, where they are, and get out there. The fields are white and ready to harvest, but the laborers are few. Not many people who are really laboring in the Lord. Most labor nowadays is fleshly labor, and it's going to go up in smoke for all those who've labored in their flesh. They thought what few that has been saved by the grace of God, the majority of them is not dedicated, separated, and consecrated. They sold out to worldly pleasures and for the time now present instead of seeking God's face early first and foremost above everything else. And so it's going to be a shameful appearance for them to suffer a great loss and be saved yet says by fire and have a lot of blood on your hands. I don't want to, I don't want to live like that. I'd rather die than live a life out of the will of God. I found the best life to be lived is a life of de- de- dedication, devotion, separation, consecration, and giving your very being, your body daily as a living sacrifice. That's a life that's well pleasing in God's sight and well pleasing to the person who's trying to practice what they're preaching. It's a fellowship. We sang a song, what a fellowship, what a joy divine, what a blessing, what a peace is mine. You have all those kind of things when you walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a glory He sheds you on, his, on, his, on your way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. We just need to learn to trust and obey. Them that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abided forever. It's a real life, living faith, and it's manifested in front of the lost and dying world. When you don't just talk it, but you walk it, that's a life and a light that shines out in the darkness, and people are able to see that and realize there's something different about you. And that, of course, that ought to be everywhere you go. Folk ought to know that you uh, are a Christian. By not the way you talk, but by that too, but by the way you walk. Not just talk it, some folk talk it, but they don't walk it. And so their lives are not like it ought to be. But our lives as a Christian is a living epistle known to the red of all men. What kind of life are you living? What kind of influence do you have on people that you come in contact with? Do they see the Lord in you? If not, they surely need to. They don't need to see the flesh and the world in you. They see enough of that everywhere else to go. They need somewhere that they can come to you as a type of a refuge. And uh, God is our refuge, and we're a refuge for the lost in a dying world. It's our place to get out of the highways, the byways, the edges, and compel them to come in. Now look in chapter number 11, if you will. This is called the, the faith chapter, the chapter of faith, and it speaks about the patriarchs of old, and makes a mention of illustrates some of these patriarchs that were in times of old. And, of course, the Old Testament, Paul's bringing this up to the Hebrew people here, speaking to them about faith and about the, those that were faithful, that died in faith, and the things, some of the few things that they experienced during the time of their pilgrimage here while they were here on this earth. They were faithful in this chapter of faith. Now, faith, he said, 
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the ingredients. It's the main ingredients. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If they come to God, must believe that He is and His reward of them that diligently seek Him. It must be a diligent search. You must seek after God with your whole heart. You done that. It's not complicated. It's, it's not. It's not hard to obtain. You, he'll be found of you, and you can abide in the shadow of the wings of the Almighty and dwell in the holy place of the Most High by keeping your hands clean and keeping your heart pure. Keep the heart with all. Keep the heart with all diligence by the heart full of issues of life. So we as a Christian have responsibility and an obligation and a duty to get out there and labor while we've got life, redeeming the time, making good use of our time for the days of evil. Faith is the substance. It's the ingredients of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's We have the evidence of things not seen. Now, the evidence for you and I as Christian, we have the unction from the Father. We have the, we have the evidence of the ingredients of the Holy Spirit in us, God in us, Christ in us, uh, called the hope of glory. He didn't leave us compass no law, but when you get saved, He puts the evidence of His presence inside you, and He gets alive in you, and transforms you, changes you, and quickens you, and makes you alive and gives you the free gift of eternal or everlasting life. The faith is the substance. It's the main ingredients of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We don't see, you don't, anything you see that's not faith, that's sight. It's the things that are unseen that we don't see, but yet we believe what God had to say. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You can't hear without a preacher, and He can't preach except to be sent. So faith is a God-given gift, one of the main gifts. Without that, it's impossible. He's got all the other gifts again as an addition to our faith. We need to build up our most holy faith. It talks about the things we ought to add to our faith. After we become a child of faith, become a believer, and have the evidence of the, of the, the evidence of the witness of the Holy Spirit inside of us. He said, but by it, the elders obtain a good report. And he's talking about the patriarchs of old. By it, the elders obtain a good report. They did that by faith, by believing God, and it was imputed unto them, the Scripture said, for righteousness, for they believe God. About it, the elder obtained a good report. If you want to obtain a good report, have a good report card in the sight of God Almighty, you've got to believe God. You've got to trust God. You've got to obey God. If you'll do that, then of course He'll be able not only to dwell in you, but to dwell in you richly. He wants to dwell in you richly, completely. He wants to sanctify you wholly, but it does not force you to make you, but He invites you and He speaks to you and deals with you as a father does his children. He'll correct you for their every ways. And so, I'd hate to go around and be a disobedient child like some of you, and I always, the only thing I ever got from him was correction, uh, a reproof. Well, of course, I'd want that as well, but uh, I'd hate to think that was all that, I, that it was between me and my God. I want that great fellowship, that great relationship. I know I have the citizenship, but I want to be what God wants me to be so that His love can dwell in me richly. I want to be rich in Christ and do the will of God and win precious souls. Through faith we understand. That's how we understand what happened, how things were created, how things were framed by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We have this blessed book, the Bible, the Word of God. It's infallible, it's unadulterated, pure, perfect, precious, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. It divides the Son, the soul, the spirit, and joint and marrow. You get a very very strict and intent and follow the one's heart. This book, the Bible, is God's Word. And when you get saved, it bears witness to your heart that you're reading a message from home, a message from heaven. It's not some fiction, fair tale, some fable. The Bible's coming up about what somebody made up or shaped up or thought about. It's God's Word. It's alive. He's alive in us. God in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Through faith we understand. That's the only way we can understand that the world we're framed by the Word of God. It spoke the Bible. That's how our faith came. Through the Scriptures, the Word of God. It pleased God to save them. It pleased God by the food and preach and save them that believe. Preaching the Word of God. That's how faith comes. Through faith we understand that the world was framed by the Word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things we now see certainly weren't made of things that do appear. It was in a different form and fashion. God created. He took nothing and made something out of that. Now I know that the world in the very beginning, but it had a beginning in this. It was void and darkness from the face even covered by water at that time. I don't know what went on before that time. Only God knows that. He didn't tell us, so I don't know. But I do know that the world was void and there was darkness from all the face even. It was covered by water. 
and read the book of Genesis, the book of the creation of the beginning. You see, I study about that. God went on to come on the scene and brought to light. He began to separate and create and then make a divine creation. And He done that. He shaped up the worlds and separated the seas and the water from the water. And then all that. Read it for yourself. I hope that you will. He created the things that we now are blessed to have and the experience that we're, the life that we're now living is a divine creation from God Almighty. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. My faith is given an illustration about, a, about two brothers here. The first two born that were born unto Adam and Eve was Cain and Abel. There they were. And they were the only two children that had this, at this particular period of time. One was of the wicked one, the devil. He didn't believe God. He did, his, his had an evil heart of unbelief. His brother believed God. He brought what God required, a sacrifice, an offering. And of course, James brought the work of his own hand. He thought he was good enough within himself to have the sacrifice that he brought offered up unto God to be acceptable. And God, he knew just like his brother knew God had already told him what was to be expected. And mother and daddy knew that. They transferred that message to them. They were without witness. Both of them knew exactly what to bring, what God required as a sacrifice, as a, as, as a picture, an atonement of a sacrifice of a lamb without spot, a lamb without blemish. For name he was before the foundation of the world, but they were to bring this sacrifice, a living sacrifice to God, and offered up as a sacrifice to God to be acceptable shedding of the blood. So he brought the labor, his work through his own hand. It's not by work that any man should boast it's a gift. God gave his son to die in our place, and he reconciled us back to God Almighty through the blood of his cross. By faith, Abel, Offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. It was a sacrifice that God required. That's the reason it's excellent meant a perfect sacrifice. He brought what God required, a, a sacrificial a lamb, a substitute that was to be made until the time when God promised He made. He said there will come, a, a, there'll come a, a, a conqueror, in other words, a, a seed that would bruise the serpent's head, reconcile mankind back to God Almighty through the blood of His cross, a promise of a Savior, a Messiah, a lamb that would be slain. He was slain before the foundation of the Lord would come and brought Rick bring Rick Reconciliation back to God Almighty through the blood of His cross. And He said, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which He obtained witness that He was righteous. And of course, uh, He is our righteousness. It's impossible to be righteous without being clothed in His righteousness, and we can only be clothed in His righteousness, and we believe what God had to say. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. We bring our broke heart, a contrite spirit, call on Him for mercy and forgiveness, who shall call upon the name of the Lord, will get saved. And then we become righteous because He's the righteous one, the justifier of them. He was delivered for all offenses, our sins, and raised again for our justification. We're justified in the sight of God Almighty, and then we become righteous because He's made us righteous, that is, He's reconciled us back to God Almighty through the blood of His cross. And then the witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gift, and by it he being dead, yet speaking, his blood cried out from the ground. And of course, he brought Cain in before him and spoke to him and asked him, well, Where's your brother? He said, Am I my brother's keeper? He said, His blood crying out from the ground. And he said, You're going to have a curse on you. You're going to be a vagabond all, all, all the rest of your life. He was cast out. He asked him to put, of course, to do something because he didn't want to be destroyed. He put a mark on him. I don't know what the mark was, but he put a mark on him so that people wouldn't kill him, wouldn't destroy him. And you can read and hope that you will over in that. Study about he also had married. Somebody said, where did he get his wife? Well, years later, hundreds of years later, uh, the others, these boys, they had, of course, others. And, of course, through Adam and Eve, they had more children. And through that, down to the center of that time, they had others that married them. And we're talking about they lived uh, uh, eight, nine hundred years old, nine hundred and fifty years old. Methuselah lived a long time. Shortage in that time was probably almost seven hundred years. And that was to replenish the earth at that time. So later in years, he had it, found him a wife. And he reads a little bit over and hope that you were studying about his lineage that come after him, the few that they were after him. It's mentioned of those that were born unto him through his wife and their children right on down. So read that for your study and hope that you will. Some of the names are similar, but it's not the same person. And they're spelled and pronounced a little bit different than what his descendants were as those that when Adam and Eve had another son. And of course, he was bound through his lineage. They talks about how the lineage of those that were of faith came. Gives you about those. If you study over that, you find out that lineage of well. By faith, in it was translated... That he should not see death. 
and was not found because God had translated him. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He pleased God. He walked with God and God took him. 365 years old. And that's 365 days in here plus, uh, of course, uh, a fourth or uh, six hours. They do that with leap year. That's how we get the leap But 365 days, uh, of course, 365 years. And God took him. He walked with God. He pleased God. And God took him. A type of translation or a rapture of the church. He was taken out. He dropped off, of course, that old body that was housed in just like Elijah did. Elijah had to be, have the transformation. He was taken up into heaven by a whirlwind, but his body was dropped off. Moses, the same thing. God buried his body. Satan himself disputed about the bones of the body of Moses. And so, of course, he said to him, The Lord rebuked thee, Satan. And, of course, God took care of that, of course, particular death when that Moses himself died. And, of course, he dropped out, dropped out of his body. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You cannot please God when you don't believe him. When you don't believe him, you don't mean to be, but, uh, and you, uh, of course, perfectly some folk deny and don't believe it. They're trying to call God a liar. That's a very terrible, horrible mistake. God, we're people, man's a liar from the very beginning. He's a liar, and, and of course, Satan's a liar, and the father of it, and he's got his crowd out there, and they certainly outnumber the, those that are believers. They certainly outnumber them. We're few, of course, compared to the many, the unbelievers. It's always been like that, but he said, without faith, it is impossible to please him. You can't please God if you don't believe what he has to say about himself and about his word, about his will, about his way. We must believe God. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. We that come to God must believe that he is. That he is the, is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And he is. And you, of course, your faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Again, they can't hear without a preacher. He can't preach except he be sent. Somebody has got, has got a, a real living live faith in them. Has got to talk to others, speak to others, and, and deliver this faith that God gave them unto others. And through that, they, of course, are able to, to hear and respond and believe and receive and become a child of faith themselves. And then study the Word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Oh, ye said of little faith. Most folk are saved now, they jar them, their faith so weak, so feeble, it's pathetic and pitiful. They just fall apart. It, it, it's the least little thing, the circumstance, or any things that comes along. They don't really trust in God and believe God like they should. They get faint-hearted. They get feeble. They fall by the wayside. Throw up their hands and want to quit. We need people that's faithful, that believe God. we got some here.